Thank you, Doug. And I wanted to thank Kate Sarther Gan for getting me involved in this and all the center people for pulling it all together. And Casa Vicente for letting us be inside because it was cold out there today. Um, I feel really strange standing up here. Um, so I'm going to try and sit, but it's hard for me to sit and talk. And I thought I had 45 minutes and no questions. So. <laughs> So anyway, um, if you have questions, please ask away, because we have all kinds of different levels of, of knowledge in this room. We have people who know more than I do about some of this stuff, and we have people who are, are new to archaeology. Um, so I kind of have to begin with the beginning, the questions I'm always asked, which is, what is ground stone? And how do you come to learn about ground stone? So I hope by the end of this talk that those two questions will be answered. Um, if not, then I guess you have to ask me. Um, ground stone is not arrowheads. Sorry, Bruce. It's not, it's not flakes. It's not the things you use to cut. It's the things you use to grind your food, polish pots, chop down trees, hoe your fields. Um, it's, it's a wide variety of tools, but these are the tools that people used in their everyday lives. You can't get any more personal than ground stone tools. So how have I come to learn about them? It's through some very personal experiences with them, through experiments, through talking to people who have used them or remember their families using them. Um, so, and then on the backs of, of other archeologists and ethnographers. So I'm going to rattle off some names, um, people like Richard Woodbury, who wrote about ground stone from northeastern Arizona. He did his dissertation completely on ground stone. He's the only other person other than me that I know who's done that. Um, but he, he worked on classification. He worked with Hopis to learn how the tools were used to, because his stones, his tools came from um, Antelope Mesa and the Genito Valley up in northeastern Arizona. And his work was done back in 1954, was published in 54. So I have used his work tremendously. Richard Woodbury and of course Emil Howry and all of his Snake Town research talked about ground stone. Um, Catherine Bartlett, who worked with Hopi uh, and, learned, and wrote a lot about Manos and Matatis. I learned a lot from her, both personally and in her writing. Um, I learned from some Hopis. Bertha Canali, who made pottery. I have some of her pottery polishers up here. After we get done talking, you can come up and look at some of this stuff. I've given you a handout also that has some examples of the ground stone artifacts in them. Um, let's see, I have, I have these names because I didn't want to forget anybody. Um, John Rinaldo uh, wrote about ground stone for Casas Grandes. And with all the work he did for Martin up in, in uh, western New Mexico and eastern Arizona. So I learned a lot from him on what he did with, with uh, Maguillon and Mimbris um, tools. Uh, I learned from ethnographers, Ruth Underhill, Kath, um, Alexander Stephen, um, Walter Huff, um, other Hopis that I learned from, uh, Stuart Tubinatawa, who is on the front page of your handout. I thought I made plenty of handouts. I made 30 handouts. So <laughs> if you can share, I would appreciate that. But on the front page is uh, Stuart Tubinatua, who was introduced to me as the warrior chief out at First Mesa. And he took me out to uh, see his mother's Peaky house um, and see how Peaky was made. So I got to see all the, the tools that were involved with making Peaky. Um, the places, oh, okay, something to do with my hands. I feel like I should read poetry or something. Okay. Um, all right, there were places that were important to me for learning how to do this, uh, beginning with Mesa Verde, the Hopi Mesas, Museum of Northern Arizona, the Point of Pines area. Um, and then the Tucson Basin. So I'm gonna be talking about all of these as learning moments uh, and, and talk about some of these people who helped me figure out these things. It's not something that I did on my own at all. Um, so let's start in Mesa Verde. Um, Mesa Verde, for those of you 
who haven't been there is full of prehistoric ruins that are made out of stone. These people lived surrounded by stone. They built their houses out of stone. They built some of their houses in stone, in cliffs. Uh, it was like living on a giant abrader. They could walk out their door and sharpen their tools on the walls or in the alcoves. And in the backs of the alcoves are all these marks where they have sharpened their bone tools or where they've shaped their ax heads um, and, and where they've done some grinding. And their rock art has been pecked into the backs of these alcoves. Um, so at Mesa Verde, the two things that were most important to me were in a museum. Um, in the museum were these dioramas. And, and the dioramas was a series of people living in pit houses, living in mesa top ruins, and living in cliff dwellings. And there were all these little tiny people running around in them, and there were dogs, and they were grinding their food, and they were killing deers and skinning them. And um, it, was just, it just made me realize that there were people involved in these ruins. They weren't just the tumbled down buildings. The other thing that had a very lasting effect on me was a woman named Esther. And Esther was a mummy. You can't see her today, she's gone. But she was 1,700 years old and in the case at the museum at Mesa Verde. And what was fascinating about her was here was a person. She didn't live at Mesa Verde. She was actually found in Falls Creek near Durango. But she was on display in Mesa Verde. And she was on display with all the tools that came from around in Mesa Verde, too. So I could look at this woman, and I could see her eyelashes, and I could see her fingernails, and I could see her skin, and I looked at her hands, and not too far away were the tools that she would have been using every day, grinding food, polishing pots. And that just, that just made it that much more personal for me to really understand that these were tools used by people. So the other things I learned at Mesa Verde in the field school that was run by the University of Colorado under the direction of David Bredernitz um, was where I learned the, the mechanics of doing archaeology analysis. I learned what pottery polishers were. And, and I learned what monos and matatis were. And I learned that there were two kinds of monos, but three kinds of matatis, which really didn't make sense to me. There were basin matatis, trough matatis, and flat matatis. And you've got pictures of all of these in the handout. Um, there's a picture of Hopi ladies lined up using, Hopi girls lined up grinding corn on flat matatis in bins. And that was what we saw in the ruins at Mesa Verde. So we had the flat matatis that would have gone in those bins. Um, but the monos were one hand monos and two hand monos. And I couldn't really quite understand how those related to the matatis and why we would analyze those separately, why the matatis would be one category of artifact and the monos another, when you couldn't grind corn with just one. You had to put them together. They were a set. So I took away from Mesa Verde those classification, you know, this is how we do it. This is what we call these artifacts. This is how we analyze them. And I took that out into the world. And so Mesa Verde was a very important place for me to learn, begin asking those questions about classification, typology, and how artifacts were used, but mostly for recognizing that there were people behind these tools. So the next stop was Ho the Hopi Mesas. And at the Hopi Mesas, I actually got to talk to people who, if they didn't still use the tools themselves, they remember their parents using them or their grandparents using them. A lot of the women still knew how to use monos and matatis to grind their corn because they had to do it for for ritual reasons. And a lot of them had the tools that had been passed down to them through the generations. And they had the piki houses, of course, which they still use today. And they had all the tools that were involved in making piki. Piki is a very thin wafered bread that's cooked on a very hot stone over a three-sided hearth. And it's made out of a very thin corn gruel that they spread very quickly over the hearth. And it it makes up a little, really paper-thin piece of corn batter that they set aside and make several layers of it and then roll it up into a roll. So it's a very thin uh, wafer-like bread. Um, and so I got to see how they made these. They use stone tools for polishing the plaster in their walls still. Every year when they whitewash their walls, they would use a stone tool on that. Um, they still use pottery polishers. 
Um, and I have some pottery polishers up here from a Hopi woman who um, gave them to me out of her collection. She gave me her worst pottery polishers, not her best pottery polishers. Um, so we saw, so I actually, the best part of this, uh, let me go backtrack a little bit. I got to do this because I worked for the Museum of Northern Arizona and they were doing an excavation ahead of some reconstruction at the village of Walpi on First Mesa. So it was my job to wash and clean all the artifacts that came out of there and catalog them. And um, the bonus on that was that I got to talk to people who lived at Hopi. I got to talk to Hopi about them. They were interested in it. They laughed at us because we were dealing with their trash, things they had thrown away. But in some cases, they were things that they had put in storage and forgotten about. So it evoked a lot of memories for them and they started talking about how these things were used. We went to um, public meetings and brought the artifacts and put them out on display. And so school kids got to look at them and they began learning a little bit more about their heritage and some of the tools that their parents and grandparents used. But for me, the best part was learning from people what these tools were. And in your handout, there's a page that has some of the, the Walby collection on it that we took and showed people. There's an assortment of, of the braiders in there. And I took them because there were some in there that I didn't know what they were. You can see little grooves in some of them where they were clearly for sharpening tools, bone tools or wooden tools. Uh, but there was a flat one, a big flat one, down in the corner that I had no idea what that one was used for. So I had them all out, and these Hopi ladies were laughing at them, mostly talking in Hopi about them. But when I asked about the flat one, this, this lady started laughing, and she says, oh, I do them on my knees and my elbows when I'm taking a shower. So, you know, again, how personal some of these tools are. Um, there's, there's um, I can't, forgot what else I put in there. Hang on. Oh, the pottery polishers. Yeah, the other thing that was, was so interesting about these is that they made me realize that sometimes my looking at just a single artifact was incomplete. That looking at just a pottery polisher really didn't give me the whole perspective on what a potter used for her tools. They'd talk about their brushes, and there are a couple of brushes in among that collection that were made out of grass stems or yucca leaves. And there were little nodules of hematite that were ground up to make the paint. That's what some of those uh, round stones are. And then there's some of the pottery polishers in there too. And then there were gourd discs that they had shaped using stone that were to um, shape their pots. So there was a wide variety of materials that were used all together in, in just doing their pottery work. So what I took away from that was that, you know, as archaeologists, we kind of divide these things into separate categories, like flake stone and ground stone and pottery, when, you know, sometimes we need to look at the accumulation of these artifacts all together to begin to understand the technological traditions um, that were important to these people in their early, everyday lives. The ones on the bottom, not everybody has a handout, so I'm talking about these two tools down on the bottom, um, probably provided me the greatest amount of information. Uh, I think any archaeologist would classify both of those as a mortar. And when we had these out on display in the public meetings, everybody talked about them. Of course, they talked about them mostly in Hopi, so I wasn't, that wasn't helping me at all. But finally, one of the ladies told me that this, this one was a mortar that they used to, to to uh, crush up dried meat for people who no longer had their teeth. So I never really would have thought about that as because I always think about mortars as being used for vegetable foods, for seeds or something like that. But they were using it to, to mush up meat. The other one was quite different. I'm sorry I don't have better pictures of these, but um, this one has a very flat bottom and a very thick rim. And if you look at the pictures, you can see that in the basin, you can see striations in the one that go around the basin. The other one, you just see impact pecks, pecking marks in them, impact fractures. Well, they wouldn't talk to me about that one very directly. And it wasn't until after the meeting was over that I asked somebody, and they told me that that was a bowl. But it was a very special bowl. It was an eagle watering bowl. 
and it was designed to be put up on their roofs and to water the eagles that they captured during, for certain rituals. So it had specific performance characteristics. The bottom was very flat, the rim was very broad so that the birds could perch on them and drink out of the bowl and not tip it over. The mortar had a very narrow rim and had a very rounded bottom. It couldn't sit flat on the, on the floor. So they would hold it between their knees and, and mix in it while they were doing stuff. So there are very different performance characteristics on these tools. So I mean, I, would, I was happy calling both of those mortars. I needed to begin to identify the performance characteristics that would allow me to separate those out in archaeological collections. How would I ever tell these apart if I didn't have Hopi people who'd use them telling me about them? But the most eye-opening one for me was um, after we were no longer working out on the reservation, we went into the Museum of Northern Arizona, and I took what I learned at Mesa Verde, and I spread out all my one-hand monos and my two-hand monos, and I was quickly recording all of that, and in walked Willie Coyne, who was a moccasin maker. And he picked up one of the one-hand monos, and he said, oh, I haven't seen this since I quit making moccasins. And I was looking like, you know, why are you using a food processing tool for making your moccasins? So Willie explained that he used it to, sometimes to grain the hide, and sometimes to make the, uh, work the brains into the hide. And remember I mentioned Catherine Bartlett? Well, she had written about this like two decades previous to my discovering this all on my own with the help of Willie Coyne. So the question was, how can I tell those apart in an archaeological collection? How can I take what I've learned from this individual and make it function for tools that I don't have people to talk to me about? So um, I started doing some experiments. I, I got some hides and I got some feed corn and I learned two very important things there. You don't process hides during the monsoon season in Tucson and you don't store your feed, cor you don't store your feed corn in your study so that the little bugs that get in there and eat them get into your bookcases. So those were two very important things. But what I began learning as I used these tools, I nailed the hide to a piece of wood and I started working the hide just to see what it felt like. What could it do? Because um, everything I had heard was that you would take a flaked stone and, and scrape off the, um, you know, the tissue that was left to the hide after it was skinned. But these rough stones wore that away very easily. And so I, I was beginning to understand that it could be very useful to have these rough stones for hide working. Um, that was after I cut out all the maggots and threw them away and worked on the hide. That's what happens when you leave hides out in the monsoon. So, um, so then I started grinding corn and um, had the matatis out and I was working on grinding and I kept smelling like I was cooking. You know, the kernels were getting smaller and smaller, but it really smelled like I was cooking it, and I noticed that the stones were getting hot. So I figured friction has got to be paying, you know, playing an important role in this. So I went to the science library and looked up friction and discovered an entire section called tribology, which is the science of lubrication and wear and trying to keep wear from happening. So this was perfect. They had already identified all the wear mechanisms for me, so I stole those ideas from them, and I started looking at the ground stone tools and saw that you could see abrasion, you could see surface fatigue. I've got some illustrations in the handout about some of those. And you could see a sheen, a tribochemical interaction, as the tribologists define it. So here was the key. The, hide, the wear on the hide processing stones looked completely different than the wear on the monos, on the, on the maize grinding tools. And what was happening was that there were different wear mechanisms going on there. So I began looking at these and quantifying, or, or not quantifying, but describing these different wear patterns that I was seeing on the tools. So that started me down a whole different uh, path of beginning to think, well, if I can see that on these tools, and I actually have these tools I brought, you can come up and look at. This was the hide processing tool, and this was the corn grinding tool. Um, I've since done many experiments since then, and people, I, I've discovered that people in Europe are very interested in these problems too. So there were a whole group of researchers over in Europe that were doing the same types of experiments and um, finding very much the same types of wear patterns on their tools too. 
So this was duplicate. You could replicate it. Um, so then I decided we needed to start looking at, at other types of wear patterns too. If we, if we can do this with food grinding and hide processing tools, maybe we could do it with pottery polishing tools. What does the wear look like on a pottery polishing tool and is it different than a, the wear on something that was used to grind to burnish stone or wood? Because you know there's tons of artifacts that they used on a daily basis, tools for weaving, for, um, for husking corn, for uh, putting in their hair, their personal ornaments. What did the wear patterns look like on the tools that were used to make those? So we've been replicating um, different kinds of, of uh, manufacturing techniques and, and um, categorizing the wear that we see on the surfaces of these tools. And I've got examples of some of these that you can come up and see later um, after I'm done talking and answering questions. But some of the pictures in the handout are other experiments that we've done involving uh, kinetics, the types of strokes that are used in tools discovering that the, the, um, what is very important is that the monos do need to fit with the metades. I mean, you can see a picture there where they don't fit, and that the strokes are different. And if you compare the um, mono in this metadi where I've got both hands on the, the uh, trough mono there, and then look at one on the last page, which is also a trough mono and it's only big enough to have one hand on. So I began realizing that the one hand mono is not a very good category for describing the, the you know, what does it mean? It's meaningless. You need to describe the mono based on the type of matadi that was used in. And I was gonna also mention Point of Pines and one of the things I learned from there was thanks to Ned Danson. Ned Danson, who is the father of Ted Danson, the actor, is one of the few people who I know who actually put monos and matadis together. And he was excavating a room in Point of Pines that had the multiple grinding bins and it had 27 monos scattered across the floor. And he took each one of those monos and fit it to each matadi that it went with and mapped all of that. That was back in the 1950s that he did that. So thank you, Ned. Um, I've kind of skipped around quite a bit on what I was going to talk about. But um, how long, how am I doing for time? OK. All right, so then in coming to Tucson, which was a different place than I had been previously, uh, and working with the whole Com collections, um, the difference between the northern part of Arizona and the southwest part of Colorado is that everything up there is sandstone or quartzite, and it's all pretty uniform. But when you get down here in the Tucson Basin, you have such a wide variety of rocks. They were selecting their rocks very carefully for the different types of activities that they wanted to use them in. And we began wondering about why. What, what, why would they select a mono, mono or matadi of different material than, than a mono? Because as we started putting the monos and matadis together, it seemed like frequently the monos would be of one rock type and the matadis would be of a completely different rock type. So we began grinding some corn to find out what it was like when you when you ground a um, mono and matadi made out of granite and or sandstone or quartzite and you find out that you get a lot of grit in the material. But the vesicular basalt monos and matadis don't put that grit in there. And if you use a basalt tool with a granite tool, you kind of counteract both of the bad, bad qualities of those. The, the good part about losing the granularity out of the stone is that it, it's self-sharpening. It keeps a fresh surface coming and the, and the mono doesn't get smooth too quickly. So having a self-sharpening mono and a matadi made out of vesicular basalt that doesn't put the grid in there is a perfect combination. If you have a, a vesicular basalt mono and a vesicular basalt matadi, they tend to, to get too smooth too quickly. And then the, the uh, vesicles in the, in the tools clog all up and you spend a lot of time sweeping that out. But that's far better than having to stop and repeck your surface if you've got a granular mono and matadi that wear smooth completely. So we began experimenting with these different types of rock and figuring out that they were very smart in selecting the types of rock that they were using for their tools. Um, 
a recent project was the Honeybee Project, where we had a lot of pebbles that looked like they should be pottery polishing tools, but they weren't. They had a different kind of sheen on them, a different type of wear pattern. So we began experimenting with doing uh, polishing wood, iron wood and mesquite, and found that we could replicate a lot of the wear patterns that we were seeing on the tools from Honeybee with wood polishing. Um, what the things they might, of course, we don't get wood artifacts. You know, the wood artifacts aren't preserved in the archaeological records. So um, we're kind of, you know, we kind of guess at what they were, what they were polishing. They could have been making wood bowls out of the ironwood or the mesquite. They could have been polishing some of their architectural pieces. Um, and I have some of the wood tools. You can see what happens when you, when you burnish wood. It gets impervious. It gets very sturdy. Were they doing that to their architectural pieces to maybe keep them from a little bit more bug resistant? Um, I, the interesting part about doing experiments is that frequently you come up with more, ex answer, more questions than you do answers. Um, on the last page is our last series of experiments. Uh, our big project that we're working on right now is the Las Capas project, which is an early agricultural complex um, that is out in um, near the Ina and I-10 area. And it's a very deep project. We got to excavate very deep in it, and we found early agricultural fields, irrigated fields. We know they were growing corn. We know they had certain types of matatis that they were using there. Um, so we began trying to, but, but what they don't have is ceramic pots. So we needed to try and figure out how they were processing their corn without ceramic pots. How were they were cooking it, how they were eating it. Uh, we knew they could be grinding it because we had the monos and matatis. Um, we started growing corn and Joyce Reichner, who is here with us tonight, grew out a whole field of corn for me. Uh, and the type of corn that they were eating was not the type of corn that we have in our supplies today. They were probably mostly eating popcorn. Uh, Reventador was the variety that Joyce grew out for me, and it's a variety of, pop, of uh, popcorn that has very small kernels, and it's probably the closest thing we could ever come up with to what they were growing back 1,300 years ago, or around 1,000 BC, maybe. Um, so we, Joyce grew this corn for him. We picked up some of it when it was green, and we, we mushed it up on a matati and found out that it made extremely sweet mush. You could make your dough right on the matati. There was no need to grind it and add water. You just mushed it right up on the matati, and it made a great dough. Joyce cooked up some food for her. Joyce, you want to stand up for a second and just say hi? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Joyce has been a great resource in growing all this corn for me. She also grew some, some Tohono O'odham 60 Day, which is a flowery variety of corn, so that we could compare what the popcorn is like compared to the flowery corn. Flowery corn was probably not grown in this area until about 400 AD. So for centuries, all they had available to eat was this popcorn. Um, so, and for centuries, they were eating it without the aid of ceramic pots. So we, we devised a pit system in the back of desert archaeology, which we managed to do without burning anything down. And we, so there are pictures of the, the burning pit in there. And we figured all of the ex ethnographic explanations of how to parch corn use sand. But they usually put the sand in a pot, or now they put it in a cast iron pot. So we figured we've got to figure out a way of doing that without any of those vessels. So we dug a pit, got really hot coals and ashes going in it, and then sprinkled in sand to slowly heat it up. We learned that after we totally smothered the fire by putting in too much sand too quickly. So we put the sand in slowly, heated it up, and threw in some kernels. There, we had a thermocouple in there um, to so that we could measure how warm the sand was getting. And um, on the bottom, you can see some of the kernels in the sand. And we also put some whole ears in there. And we figured out how not to do this. 
uh, the, the worst thing you can do is get the corn too close to the coals. It immediately pops it and then burns it, or it burns it and doesn't even pop it. So we, we figured out slowly how to, how to cushion the kernels in with another layer of sand and put the, the um, coals, hot coals and ash on top of that so that it kind of cooked it in between the burning coals in this layer of sand, got the sand up to about 300 degrees centigrade. And um, I don't think we quite let it stay in there long enough. Um, we haven't ground it yet, so we're not quite sure how successful we were, but um, we'll be doing that maybe this Friday. We have Science Fridays at Desert Archaeology. This was one Science Friday, and we're going to be doing some grinding. Um, Stacy's grinding some corn down here on the bottom for another experiment. But I'm very interested to see how this Reventador is going to turn out, because for some test experiments, we, d we ground some Orville Redenbacher. I, was, I wanted to see if or Orville Redenbacher would be a good substitute for what they grew a thousand years BC and decided that it's not at all. What was very interesting was when we popped it and ground it, it made this beautiful white fluffy flower. Uh, when we ground the kernels just dried, you get, very, you get no flower out of it. You just mostly get chunks of the pericarp, the hard part that gets stuck in your teeth. Um, I even played around with soaking it and then grinding it on the matatis, and that, that made a huge mess. So I don't recommend it that. But um, what we learned with the green corn, Joyce harvested some of it while it was green, and we tasted it, and it was extremely sweet. We, we made it into the dough balls on the matatis, and then we dried some of it. And when we dried the Reventador, still gr it was green, it was still sweet, and you could just take the cob and run that across the matati and make a beautiful flower out of that. Then we dried it, and, and that's what we're going to test next. That's what we have in the queue next, is we're going to draw, we're going to grind the dry, and we're going to parch it and grind that, and then it popped. It was amazing how, how easily it did pop. It didn't pop up as nice as Orville Redenbacher, but it did pop. So, um, I think the next time we do this, we'll have it down pat. We'll know a little bit better how to, how to parch corn in a pit without a ceramic pot. I don't think they did this for all their corn. I don't think this was a big thing. I think they did it to enhance recipes. And this is the next thing I would really like to, we have a, like to pursue, is we have all these different tools, grinding, pounding, mortars and pestles. They had to have been making different recipes with this corn. Parching it adds a nutty flavor, and that would add a different flavor to the corn if they just dry grind corn. That would give it a different flavor. Amaranth has a little different flavor, and if you parch amaranth, that gives it even a different texture and a different flavor. Uh, mesquite has a different flavor. It's a little sweet, too. So I think they had access to all these different foods that they used in different recipes. It's not like they just ground the same old corn and ate the same old thing every day. And I think we kind of get stuck into that mindset that, um, you know, they only had one way of processing, um, and that was to dry the corn and then grind it. And I think pre, well, at this time, the types of matatis that they were using were basin and flat. They weren't using the trough matatis yet. They didn't begin using the trough matatis until about 400 AD, which is when the flowery varieties of corn began. So I think those two things probably came together. When they were able to grow corn that dried could make more flour, dry grinding it, um, then the trough design made sense. The other thing about dry grinding is it doesn't take a lot of fuel and it doesn't take a lot of water. And you can store dried corn a whole lot longer than the fresh corn. So I think there were a, a whole slew of things that were happening um, at about the same time where they could, could grow flowery corn, grind it in large trough matatis with large monos, and um, not have to process it wet, um, using a lot of soap. Nish, oh, here's the new word. This is the new word, nishtamalization. And that's where, you know, you make comni. You, you add lime to the corn and soak it. And when you do that, you can make an incredibly fine flour which you can make, use different recipes. That's what you need when you're going to make piki, is that incredibly fine flour. 
So, but you need it, you need to be able to grind it very fine. So, how am I doing for time? Okay. I kind of rambled around on that. If anybody has questions. Jenny, you mentioned early on about washing and cleaning artifacts before you analyze them. Have I don't know if that's still step number one, but have you been able to do any kind of residue analysis and on ground stone at all with stuff that may have survived for these lengths of time? We, we've been doing some experiments with doing residue analyses. And what's, what's good for residue analysis is that the ground stone, particularly monos and metates, let's talk about those, um, are porous. And as you use them, the, the oils and everything soaks in to the stone. So you can take a core. In fact, one of my students took cores out of my old stones, which have been sitting around for 30 years now. And she wanted to study whether the, the residues were deteriorating. So she could do that by coring these tools and looking at that. Um, it's, it's a complicated study, the lipids and residues um, deteriorate differently depending upon what it is. So it's not an easy fix. Yeah, it's a complicated chemical study. And uh, Tammy Bonacera is the student who's been working on this. She's working on it for, for her dissertation. Um, and she's published articles about it and about how complicated it is. And, and sort of following on that is doing pollen studies on it too. These tools sit in the ground buried in dirt, and so whatever is in the dirt also gets soaked into the surfaces of the tools. So in order to do pollen analysis and residue analysis, you can't just have the tool. You need to also have the soils that are surrounding, so you have to take soil samples so that you can evaluate whether what you're finding on the tool is a product of its use or a product of the environment that it was buried in. So it's, it, it's coming. We're working on it. but. Um, it, it's got limited application right now. So as far as washing, um, I know I get this question a lot. Um, you know, you can wash them. You don't particularly want to do acid on them. Some of them it's okay, but even I have, we have artifacts that come in that are even have re, have um, pigment on them, and they get washed. Sometimes you can't see the pigment until you get the dirt off of them, and that survives. You have to you'd have to really scrub a tool to get all the pigment. Um, and stuff off it. So I was looking at something today that had remnants of clay stuck down in it and pigment. So they were doing something with clay on that particular tool. So is that? OK, I think we had a question over here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, early on in your talk, you mentioned the pottery polishers. And I was wondering what those are made out of. You know, it, they're made out of a variety of tools or uh, rock types. I have several of them up here, and you can come look at them later and see that they're made out of all kinds of different types of rock, which seems to be the rock of choice is not what the rock type is, so long as it's smooth, but that it's been river tumbled. Those are the best pottery polishers. And uh, anybody who comes, is going to come up and take a look at these, it's going to start making you paranoid about finding polishers in the archaeological record. Because um, there's some that they use just a little tiny area on, like if they're, if they're polishing under the lip of a, uh, under the rim of a pot. Um, and, you know, if you're excavating a site that's on a river terrace, telling a pottery polishing stone apart from just a regular water pebble is not always easy. It takes a fair amount of time to get the wear to build up on them. So, um, you know, chalcedonies, cherts, igneous rocks, um, but even some you know, water tumbled quartzites and that kind of stuff. So long as that surface has been water worn and is smooth, that's the, that's the performance characteristic that you need. A question here. Did you find any axe heads? Oh yeah. And axe heads is what, mainly one of my favorite. were they from the same era? Uh, not, not in the early site. Are you asking about the yes. early agricultural right. site? No, no. We don't see any axe heads in the Tucson Basin until around, again, about 425. What about shells and shell jewelry? Uh, yeah, there is shell at Las Cabas. Chris would know more about that than I would. <laughs> but yes, we get shell jewelry and we get stone jewelry. That's the, you know, the 
to define what ground stone is, I mean, you, you would even include uh, stone beads and um, pendants and things like that in ground stone because they've been shaped by grinding and polishing, drilling. Um, you know, frequently they flake them first to shape them, but then they polish the flaking part out so you can't see them. Um, I have a great, one of the great things we learned uh, out of the Honeybee Project and the Yuma Wash Project this past year is that they were imitating stone beads by making them out of clay, which was, um, some of them, they were so good at making out of clay that I had to have a microscope to see the features that showed that they were made out of clay. And some of them I was so insecure about, we ended up, um, Mary Olmsby, who works for Desert Archaeology, went in and used a scanning electron microscope and some chemical analyses to help me separate out the clay beads from the stone beads. So. Next any, question. Anybody else? Back to Bruce again. <laughs> Uh, I've always assumed that basalt and maybe some other ground stone resources were traded around the valley or whatever. Could you, is, is that a correct, I mean, or, you know, that you didn't have the, the, the proper rock available locally everywhere. Have you looked at those kind of questions and any observations on that? We Thanks. have. I think, I think the easiest one to answer is the vesicular basalt stuff, which we all know about A Mountain and Black Mountain and Martinez Hill and all those mountains. They're on the south side of the Tucson Basin. Well, we were finding vesicular basalt up at Honeybee, which is on the north side of the Tucson Basin um, and away from the rivers. Um, that stuff is moving around because it does, particularly for food processing tools, does have very good performance characteristics and it's durable and like I said doesn't put a lot of grit in in the flour. Um, so that stuff was moving around quite a bit. The other stuff that seems to be moving around is mica. We get a lot of mica discs and the, the pieces of mica that are large enough for that would come out of the Catalinas. Um, so that's moving around a lot. The turquoise of course which we haven't exactly pinned down Eat where these pieces are coming from, we do have the potential to do that now with several students who are working at uh, the chemical analyses of turquoise. Um, we get from, from outside the basin coming in, we get certain phyllites. Some of we think are coming from the Gila area, the Salt Gila area. Uh, there's some uh, probably from the San Pedro area. We haven't nailed these down exactly. Uh, the pallets. The no, it's phyllite. Phyllite is the rock type. And they were using those to make pallets um, and some other uh, small pieces. Um, some argillite that comes around from various parts of, in central Arizona. There's no argillite. There's some siltstone, some red mudstone that looks very similar to argillite. Um, and actually, I now have a student, Katie, uh, who's a uh, Vance Holiday student, and she's doing geology and archaeology, and she's making me type collections right now for um, pinning down. We've been, she and I, and she by herself, just been walking some of the arroyos, picking up what types of rocks. The arroyos are, you know, Santa Cruz Wash, the CDO, the Rito, the Tanca Verde, all of those are bringing rocks from the mountains down into the middle of the basin, and those are tremendous resources to exploit. Um, one we think we might have nailed down for the Las Capas project is uh, white quartzite that they love to make their monos out of. This, this, uh, it's been river tumbled, um, so it's coming down, seems to be coming down in the Santa Cruz, and we think maybe the source for that is in the Santa Ritas. So we're beginning to identify some of that, but, but the beautiful part about the Tucson Basin is there's all these different rock sources, and so many of them end up in the waterways, and all you have to do is rock the basins. And, you know, I thought they'd probably have to go to the, the source for the vesicular basalt uh, and quarry that or, or take those pieces off the mountain. But um, Alan Denoyer is another one who loves to walk the washes. He told me just the other day he found a piece that was big, well, probably the size of this chair of vesicular basalt running down the, the Santa Cruz. So, um, you know, those are great for taking material from far away and bringing it into. But then they were also going up into the mountains and procuring 
um, granites and, and rhyolites and that kind of stuff too. So um, this is something that I've been a little bit late at coming towards and with Katie's help we're really going to talk more about materials moving around the Tucson Basin. So anybody else? Question here? Yeah, I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about how they use the rhyolites. The rhyolites? Yeah. Right now, I've got the most fabulous, large uh, matatis made out of the rhyolite. And what's really good about these rhyolites, they're red, but they're, um, they lose the phenocrysts out of them. So they get a texture that's kind of like the vesicular basalts, and they're very durable. Um, so they're making these fabulous basin matatis out of the rhyolite in, in these early agricultural sites. Uh, I have a, one out in the lab right now that has a hole that's been knocked in the bottom. That's one of the other things we've been experimenting with is inten the intentional destruction of tools. And uh, we spent one Science Friday putting holes in the bottom of a trough matati that was about four centimeters thick and it took us four hours to knock the hole through it with an indirect percussion technique. But it, you know, it's not something you do casually. And it wasn't worn through. We intentionally put the hole through the bottom of that. So, so this rhyolite, one that's out in the lab right now, has a intentionally hole, an intentionally flaked hole through the bottom of it. Are they good for polishing? It would be if it was river tumbled. So yeah, if you had a small one or, or even a a hand-sized one that had been river tumbled, that would make a good polisher. Okay, we have another question over here. <laughs> Let me just uh, comment that Jenny's an incredible example of a person whose passion for a certain kind of artifact has really <laughs> generated amazing new knowledge over the course of her career. So. Um, but with that, you've, you've been talking mostly about things that are coming out of prehistoric archaeological contexts. And one of the big surprises that your work uh, had was to help locate the uh, blacksmith shop in the Tucson Presidio, just north of, of uh, the north side of the city, the west side of City Hall there. And could you share how the, the, what those artifacts looked like and how your studies help to pinpoint where the, the blacksmith shop was. We did that years ago. Years ago. <laughs> that was a long time ago. And that was kind of surprising to me, too, because, um, you know, frequently the historic part of Tucson is built on top of the prehistoric part. And since most ground stone tools are prehistoric, I just assumed that these were going to be prehistoric tools that I was looking at. But I had to use a microscope to see this. There were little bits of metal in, in the interstices, it's called, in the valleys in, in the rock. And I couldn't figure out what it would, I certainly hadn't seen anything like that on a prehistoric tool. So I thought, well, maybe they were pounding nails with it or something. So I went in and I talked to Homer about it. And he said, well, yeah, it was a blacksmith shop. So, you know, it just, um, I, I don't know whether it's better to look at things ignorant of their context and then try and figure out or whether, you know, whether you go into it already prejudiced. If, you, if, you, if I knew it was from a blacksmith shop, I, you know, I don't know. It's the circle of knowledge. But yeah, it's been, it's, uh, I'm not going to tell you how many decades I've been doing this, but I, I've learned a lot and a lot of it has been, I mean, there's so much, especially in the Tucson Basin, the variety of archaeology that we have available here from this prehistoric, you know, this early agricultural stuff I, I've been talking about. I, I am just amazed at how complex this assemblage is from the early agricultural time period. They're, they're doing multiple activities. They're not just processing food. There's all kinds of things that they're making back then. And some of it is just based on the use wear that we're seeing on the polishers. They weren't polishing pots back then, so all of these polishers had to have been doing something else. Wood or bone or um, stone, shell, yeah, lots of shell. So, um, so yeah, thank you, Bill. <laughs> One question up front. 
as a kid growing up in northern Arizona, I used to hike around a lot, and I found what I, th what I think may have been a matate and a mono, but the matate was a huge piece of rock. It was just uh, basically a 20-foot wide boulder, about eight foot tall, and in the middle of that was what appeared to be a man-made depression. And there was uh, what I think was a mono next to it. Is it possible that they built matates into a huge boulder like that? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. Matate, well, basins, mortars, um, cupules. I've been out uh, looking at things out on the Tucson Basin area, and there are these cupules, little things that are pecked in. You know, when they're out there tending their fields or hunting or something like that, I'm sure they, they would use a big rock like that for grinding food or, I think a lot of times all those things are used for sharpening tools. And we, we, I've seen some where the, the grinding slick is actually facing vertically. So it looks like a mono would run through there very nicely, but there's no way it would hold the meal in while you were grinding it. But it'd be a perfect place to make the mono maybe or sharpen the ax head or something like that. So yeah, they were using the landscape as they were out there for all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. They did it in California too. They've done it all over the world. This is one of the best um, uh, sort of side projects I've gotten involved with is people from all over the world are, you know, sending me pictures of their bedrock, trying bedrock features. Some places they're called Bulan. In Ireland they call them Bulans. In um, Israel they're calling them rock cut installations. And they're, they're all kinds of, there's, they're the cupules, they're the mortar basins, the matati slicks. Um, it's universal.